And there was an opportunity on the big screen to create a lost world that Arthur Golden had observed with great specificity, which no one in the audience could get on a plane and travel to. As producers, you just don't have that many opportunities to make a movie that's such a passport to another world and introduces people to a foreign culture the way this does. It was so captivating and so enrapturing, I just didn't want to leave that world. I was moved by it the moment I read it. Because at the core is this incredible story of this one child who is ripped from her family and sold into slavery. And she survives through such cruelty and finds this glimmer of hope. And that's moving to me, and I think it's moving to just about anybody in the world. Everyone can relate to that great human struggle to become your best self and to make your dream come true. When I meet people who've read Memoirs of a Geisha, they very often imagine that the character of Sayuri is a real person. And they ask me things like, is she still alive? And so I don't know whether to say, well, actually, she's dead, or whether to say, well, actually, she's not only dead, but she never existed in the first place. <laughs> I started writing a book about a geisha when I was in my mid-twenties. And it really focused on, on the son, and the mother was a kind of incidental character, though she was a geisha. But it was only a little bit later when I discovered actually a book by Liza Dalby called Geisha, that I got a glimpse into the world that I really hadn't imagined, hadn't been that interested in, and decided I was writing about the wrong thing, so I threw out the poor kid and I took up with his mother instead, so to speak. He wrote several drafts of this novel until he found the story. And through Liza Dalby encouraging him to go back to Japan and spend time with real geisha and trying to help him find the person that would open up a little bit so that he could just get that glimpse into the world and get the geisha character right. And at this point, I got a new boost of confidence because I felt beforehand, I was imagining a world but now I know what it's really like, and it's more exciting to me. I decided the thing I'd done wrong was I couldn't imagine what it was like to be a geisha, so I had to do it in third person. In fact, I decided that's what a novelist is supposed to do. You're supposed to put yourself in the mind of your characters. So I went back and started over with her as a little girl and tried to imagine what her life might have been like for her. The novel came out in the fall of 1997, and pretty much right away it hit the bestseller list, to my absolute astonishment. Of course, Hollywood got interested, and Columbia Pictures bought the book about a month after it had come out. A very dear friend of mine called me, and he's always been brilliant on trends. And he said, there's this book coming out called Memoirs of a Geisha. He said, it's going to catch a popular culture wave. So the guy had some credibility with me, so I picked it up. I read it in a day or two. And you know, you can't put it down. And I instantly wanted to make it into a movie. I had done a lot of movies with Steven Spielberg, I think about 12 or 14 actually all together as an executive. And I immediately thought he would love this book. And at that point he had said that he was taking two years off. And I said, well, just I just have a feeling that you're gonna love this book. And so within a day or two of getting it on vacation, he called up and said, I'm halfway through, I have to direct it. At that point, it got on the fast track, and there were a couple of months there where it looked as if the film would go into production in the fall of that same year. But eventually, Spielberg came up with something else he wanted to do, and then a couple of directors sort of flirted with it at one moment or another, and finally, about a year ago, uh, it landed in Rob Marshall's lap. So with Rob, we had a chance of getting a really gifted filmmaker who you saw by the filmmaking skills in Chicago could really deliver this lost world and had the filmmaking craft to do it. He doesn't quite remember it this way, but it is true. I pursued him ardently, and he wouldn't return my phone calls for many months, actually. He was very busy with Chicago, getting many awards and doing a lot of publicity for the movie, and I just kept calling him and calling him and calling him. Lucy and Doug kept sending me things, like stunning books about geisha, and it was a riot. 
it was, it worked. <laughs> it ultimately worked. I felt because Arthur Golden had written this novel, a man had written this novel, that helped me unlock how I would enter this. The discipline involved in becoming a geisha was similar to the discipline that I had to go through when I became a dancer. Rob Marshall he has lived the artist life. He understands music and movement. He understands drama. He has a kind of showman quality. He loves presentation. We're smoking and drinking and watching Wayne Newton. <laughs> and all of that is kind of the geisha part of Rob. I just started from scratch. I think it's the only way to work. So I, I literally began with the book and uh, hired a wonderful writer, Robin Swicord. They needed to green light this movie, but they couldn't green light it until they knew what it would cost. They wouldn't know what it cost until there was a script, and there might not be a script for a while. And so we had to come up with an outline that would be the same as a script. Obviously, this is a 400-page novel, and it needed to become a two-hour and something movie. So we needed to sort of find the, the skeleton of the story and, and also how we were going to tell it. You know, what was the point of view? Adapting from a novel is really an interpretive art. You're reading the book and you are bringing your own interpretation from your own experience, your own sense of aesthetics, your own understanding of drama. We benefited hugely from Arthur's hard work. And we've been really careful with the adaptation. And Rob had absolute clarity about his path through the novel. Because he has this background as a choreographer, one of the things that he likes is to really see something on its feet. So we might talk generally about, well, maybe we should end the scene in this different way. And he would want to see it that way and also the second way, you know? And then maybe he wanted to see it a third way. What Arthur succeeded in doing in the book is finding something that's very esoteric, but showing us exactly how, it, how it's relevant to us and in a culture of concealing emotions. I found this image of the woman biting her kimono sleeve. And this image is the highest expression of emotion that we're allowed to see in a geisha. The woman puts her sleeve up and bites it because she's pushing back what she really wants to say. And that was, for me, this was my talisman when I was writing. Part of, of the art of the book is to explain that world enough to the audience so you can be on that game board, rooting Sayuri on, understanding the rules she's playing by. That kind of work has to be done very quietly under the surface of the script. And it's really better done by example. There was a slight burden sometimes placed on Auntie because she would have to say, oh no, these kimonos belong to the Okia. These are all hers. Certainly not. They belong to the Okia. So, you know, then you would know, oh, that's why you have to be dressed up. You can't afford the clothes. You have to be tied to an Okia. And so everybody played their own part in explaining a little bit. What I find is more important than the world that it takes place in is the journey and the story uh, emotionally of this one character. I wanted to see immediately that she's taken out of love, taken from family, and then ultimately at the end returned to love. So everything had to feed that for me. You have to find the overarching story in which she has become the greatest geisha in Kyoto. She's lost that because of the war, and she's still moving toward a dream that she's had since she was a child. I think the hardest thing about adapting this book is a lot of the story takes place inside Sayuri's head. So we had to figure out a way to convey the love and the longing that she felt towards the chairman without superimposing tons of voiceover. We didn't have the luxury of Arthur Golden's could go inside her head and say however she felt whenever he wanted to, so. When you're a novelist, 
You're responsible for every effect on the page. You really don't have anything but those words. And so when there's an emotional crescendo, you have to be very clear. It reads like one. But with a screenplay, the emotional crescendos often come from the acting, the camera work, the music. There's so many other elements. We had to see it in her eyes. We had to see it in the gestures of keeping the handkerchief. We had to hear it occasionally in the voiceover. We had to just keep putting those little strands in so that slowly you built to the sense of repression and longing that you were just going to burst if it didn't come true. In many ways, this is a story of four geisha, and we follow what happens to each of them and how they deal with being a geisha. Mameha, she lives as the perfect geisha, and she puts her heart on ice. She cannot love the man she truly loves, which is the Baron. You had feelings for the Baron, didn't you? I never allowed myself that. Atsumomo combusts, self-destructs, because she can't live that life. Pumpkin is a failed geisha who never quite makes it. Look at her, still a virgin, Michael. And so she becomes a prostitute. <laughs> so Yuri survives because of the drive and spirit in her. So it's fascinating to see how this world affects and what the consequences are for these four different women. It's been a kind of a long haul in some ways. The novel came out almost eight years ago, but I've been very lucky because Rob said to me very early on, I want to make a movie you love. And, uh, and he seems to be very taken with the book and wants to bring it to life rather than bringing something inspired by it to life. One of the real pleasures for us as producers has been able to return a favor to somebody. Arthur Golden wrote a book that we were besotted with, truly besotted with, and then many years passed with us struggling and toiling and still no movie to show to Arthur Golden. And one of the great pleasures for us was watching Arthur Golden come on the set and see these characters that he had labored literally 10 years to create. The first thing I said was, oh my god, I think I'm going to cry. Oh. And then Truman started crying. Oh. To feel that we had done them justice was a real extra bonus for us to, to be able to do for him what he did to us, which is say, here's this wonderful thing, let, me get, let us give it back to you. Tradition comes from theater. We get to show that there's much more to a geisha than her relationship with a man. And that ultimately, she is an artist first. And that's what you spend your time doing, training to sing and play the shamisen. You learn the art of conversation, and of course, the most important art, which is dance. It really was like geisha boot camp, but there had to be a sense of joy. There had to be a sense of fun, because um, we were all doing something that was impossible. <laughs> it was impossible. How did he become a geisha in six weeks? We all held hands and jumped off the, the cliff together. We had one month of preparation for a kind of geisha boot camp, 
and to go through it every single day for months straight was very unfamiliar. We practiced sitting, we practiced walking, and learning to kneel and bow and pour tea. We had dialect lessons every day. They had movement classes so they could learn to wear the kimonos. Opening doors, closing doors, you know, handing out sake, you know, receiving a cup, using your fan, the reason you use it, when you use it. It's about the art of conversation. It's about keeping, you know, entertainment in a very high form. We learn how to walk like a geisha, how to walk in like a tight kimono, and how to like flip fans and do all that stuff. And they just wanted to give us a feel of like being a geisha in training. I did it. I didn't really need to learn that much of this stuff. It was mostly like um, sayuri and pumpkin and mameha and atsumomo that have to learn like the full, you know, geisha package. We started at nine in the morning and finished at six in the evening, sometimes even later. We were taught to dance, play musical instruments, give tea service. It was like a boot camp, but definitely very useful. Hello. Renee Zellweger coined the phrase originally for Chicago. I just remember Renee talking a lot, a lot about the boot camp. And it's the same with this, and doing it over and over again. It was very much like the geisha's training. It was rigorous training, but always there was Rob coming in the room so excited about what they were doing. I wanted to make it feel like it was a playground, a place where you could really fall on your face and it would be okay. We had seven rooms working at the same time. Uh, an acting room where I'd be working with the actors and blocking the scenes and so forth. And John's room where he'd be teaching dance. And Liza Dalby had a room where she was teaching them how to walk, how to move, how to pour tea. You hold it so it's more centered. We had a room for dressing, learning how to wear the clothes, how to put on the makeup, how to do the hair. It's already bad. In another little room, there'd be a shamisen lesson. And then we had a, a couple rooms for dialect and learning how to speak the language. It was like a little mini conservatory in Memoirs of a Geisha. And that's a, that's a great opportunity you don't get very often on feature films. Liza was the only foreign woman ever to become a geisha. She became our teacher to our actors and taught them all the rules that go along with being a geisha. Geisha are our masters of wearing kimono. This is what really sets them apart from ordinary women in Japan. Once you put on the kimono, your whole posture everything changes. You have to learn how to walk in them because the way of dressing, the way of your legs, your thighs, everything has been slender, tapered down. And then when you walk, to make the, the, the kimono rustle, there is a certain style where they sweep their feet around. So it's a method that uh, complements the outfit. And that's, and that's During the geisha boot camp, um, apart from walking, is the kneeling, how you get down on the floor without you know, your hands and your being everywhere. It's um, learning to use, I suppose, movements rather than just sheer brute force. You can't use your hands, so it requires a fair amount of leg strength and just practice. In the pre-modern period, Japanese didn't have chairs. You, you sat on the floor, so everyone was used to doing that from a very young age. I got used to it because I went to Japan when I was 16, and uh, I spent a lot of time in that position while I was playing the shamisen. But I can tell you that that was very difficult um, for all of the actresses. And we, um, we resorted to these little cheat seats that you can kind of stick under your bottom as you sit down and take some of the weight off your legs, and that keeps your legs from falling asleep. It's very conservative and very, just like, um, boop, 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 very quiet and, you know, pulled together, very dignified, just very slight. You don't take big steps, you don't move your arms big, you don't shake your head big. In the audition, I, when I was acting as Pumpkin, I'd, like, I'd, being an American, I just like, oh, what? I kind of do it. What I was And I just, like, move my arms and my head and my facial expressions, like, a ton. And that's actually one direction that Rob gave me. He said, don't move at all. Glue your hands to your legs and just be a geisha. 
I have been a dancer, I've been an athlete, I do martial arts, you know, I do crazy stunts and things like that. But this has, because everything is so contained, it has to look effortless. Mameha was the epitome of the geisha. I had better be convincing, you know, what I was doing so that I looked right when I taught Sayuri how to do it. Yeah. I spent a lot of time watching Liza. You know, even after all these years that she's not been in Japan, it stays with her. If you watch her, the way she moves, the way she talks, the little, you know, movements, she holds her head. It's these little things that matters. I was in charge of the, uh, the scenes where they'd play shamisen, so we spent hours having shamisen lessons. Uh, I first went to Japan um, as a high school student in the uh, in the 60s. And I knew nothing about geisha at the time. I just had heard this instrument, uh, loved the sound of it, and so began taking lessons. It's always been associated with geisha. It has three strings, no frets. Basically, it's used as uh, accompaniment for a narrative style of singing. And it has this wonderful kind of twang to it and this percussive snap when you hit the, um, the plectrum. Who knows why the sound of something appeals to you as opposed to something else, but all I know is, is from the first time I heard it, I really loved it and I knew that I wanted to play this instrument. I just remember everybody walking through the halls and <laughs> just being inundated with all these foreign languages. We had a wonderful uh, dialect coach, Jessica Drake. You look beautiful. Who helped the Japanese actors and the Chinese actors and the American Asian actors all sort of combine and find sort of a common language. They also have to understand what they're saying when they say it, so that when the words come out of their mouths, they actually can connect to that, that thought and that feeling. Suzuka, it's remembering to put the tongue at here for the mm, fun again. It's very challenging, and particularly for the actors who essentially are learning English phonetically. Some of whom are so amazing, you would have absolutely no idea that's what they're doing. Nobody told me what a geisha is. You will find out soon enough. Suzuka. She doesn't speak any English, but she's picking it up every day. She's got that wonderful thing that children have. She's a sponge, and she just soaks it up, and it sticks. How did you come by such surprising eyes? My mother gave them to me. It's about getting the sounds right, but then also getting the rhythm, the emphasis, the stress, the melody. And the melody of English is quite different, obviously, than the melody of Chinese and Japanese. We use an alphabet, they use word pictures, which is just a completely different way of relating to language. So it's quite a challenge. He says that as you're exiting. Actually, the one person who is in the biggest trouble is Rob. He's standing in front of us, and you know, we're speaking in Mandarin, in Cantonese, in Japanese, in English. And he has to wait for us all to finish talking first and go, OK, my turn. Now, <laughs> what was going on? When should she find them? On her own. There's something about a relationship between a director and an actor that transcends language. It just does. When Rob is giving the screen direction, you will often hear the Chinese translators, the Japanese translators, and yet it's flawless. They've worked so hard to do this. I really find a lot of parallels with becoming an artist. To become a geisha, you train since you're a child on singing, dancing, you know, learning the art of discussion. The discipline involved in becoming a geisha was similar to the discipline that I um, had to go through when I became a dancer. Completely different worlds, but there was a similar path in terms of the devotion to the art, the um, the rigor in becoming an artist and what you go through. Being on this film has been an incredible journey into a mysterious place which you keep finding out more and more things. And once you find out something more, it seems to be more mysterious than when you first started out. The geisha world is a hidden world. It's a sensual, exotic, 
hidden place with great mystery. What a wonderful way to spend a few hours in the theater, disappearing into this kind of world which so few people know anything about. In an odd way, I have to be honest, I still feel that it's as mysterious now, even though I know so much more <laughs> about it, obviously, um, as it was when I first started the project. I chose to take license with the dress and the look of the geisha in the movie. I wanted to see it through a child's eyes and, and understand what the geisha were in the 30s. They were the fashionistas of their time. They were the supermodels, if you will, the movie stars of their time. <laughs> He just wanted a very um, high fashion, he says, you know. Think of geishas on a Paris runway. And that's basically what we did. Our neck line, for instance, in the back, is lower to give it more of a provocative look. The waists are tighter, not as boxy. The eyes were bigger, darker. The lips were fuller. For our movie, we were less white makeup because Rob wanted something different. He wanted to have the kind of beauty that is more modern. Yeah. <laughs> There was many, many camera tests and test cases. The first we did uh, um, very authentic white geisha makeup. Then second time was how much I can go for, how much I can soften, and how much I can exaggerate, because I'm not here to do documentary. All of us on the film, along with Rob, took a lot of time, you know, finding out what was real in the time and in the world that we're examining. Can we do a black and white one too, just to have it? We need to make sure no we're sort of doing an impression of the time more than a reality of the time. That's the one, right? Yeah. yeah. You want to hear a Rob, you would never lose the trueness, the uniqueness of what is Japanese, so that when we put on our costumes, we feel the part, and it does take you into that world. First one will be up. And playback. <laughs> It's all a seduction, really. It's a very sensual world. It's not the sexuality of 2005. And there's something wonderful about returning to a time or just a glimpse of a wrist with something quite sexual, quite alluring. Everybody have a different point of view of us what's sexy. Japanese custom is just cover. Cover is so sexy. Not, and uh, this is not sexy, you know, you know what I mean? Yeah. Action. Yes, same thing, back neck. The back neck 
in the kimono. So sexy. And uh, because they are very mysterious. For Geisha and Michael, especially Michael, the, we leave this naked part of the skin. And that is to say, let the people imagine what's underneath. You see the V on the back of their neck, where you have the white paint revealing glimpses of skin. Well, that's provocative and sensual. Todd is doing a two-leg, which is for the every day, for the nape. And Kate is doing a three-leg, which is used for ceremony and a festival. I went on some of Colleen's missions to old kimono stores in Kyoto, where she picked up a lot of kimono that are authentically from this era. It's a wonderful period of Japanese fashion history, the colors, the patterns from the 20s and 30s. A beautiful kimono could be worth what a worker would make in a year. Unbelievably expensive. Okay, that was excellent, guys. Well, nowadays, if you wear a kimono, it will always be two layers. In the period of this movie, it have been at least three. And if you were a geisha, you may have had as many as four or five layers. I had no idea how many layers were involved. I, I, it was, I couldn't quite believe it. And I couldn't believe that the patience it took. These kimonos are not easy to put on. You need two people to do the job and it takes at least an hour. When you wear a kimono, you cannot move like you're, you're wearing jeans. You have to learn how to move with the kimono, and you learn how to be elegant, because, you know, by just wearing it, you are restricted. So I can understand why in old days, Japanese are so restricted in many different ways. And now people are more open because of the clothing can bring out their different nature. There's 12 pieces to each costume, a lot of which are hidden underneath. This is what one of the many undergarments that are worn with kimonos, and some of them are quite beautiful. I mean, some of them, uh, to the Western eye, look like kimonos, but they're, they're actually um, the layer that they wear underneath. Around here are the um, under kimonos. These are what the, the um, geisha wear under their, underneath the robe that I just showed you. It's this and this sort of half-slip thing. So they are well covered up in their life underneath their kimono. The geisha are the only ones that wear the red collar, the young geisha. When they become a mature geisha, they change to a white collar, which is something like that. When you become a geisha, a full geisha, they say you've turned the collar from red to white. <laughs> the obi is very constricting because it's similar to a corset. It's wrapped as tightly as a corset is wrapped because it holds the whole kimono in place. So there was a lot of things that these girls had to put up with to conform to what was perceived as beautiful at that time. I need to just change one of, of the course. clothes here a little bit. I'm okay. trying not to disturb your class. Okay, and then... Uh... Geishas wore wigs, but the Michaels didn't. So we use it, we use the wax. This wax is really hard, it's very sticky. 
and um, and you put this on the hair, but it does, as you would see, keep the hair in place. You know, like all this stuff. It just keeps it in place. Up to the little fuzzies here, all that's waxed. Oh, God. And the, the waxing, I've heard that a lot of um, geisha, they like, bald. They start to bald up on the top of their heads from all the pulling and yanking, getting the hairstyle right. They slept on a little log, so their hair was never messed up. Their hair also was never really clean because they only went every two weeks to get their hair done. Well, you should be more traditional. Yeah, I think that. Yes, and, this, and it's nicer to see the round for you, for yeah, your debut, so. and every time we see you as a mic go. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. You got it, baby. As we worked on each character, we really felt that we needed to design the hair and makeup specifically for those characters. Hatsumomo has times when she's out on the street and she has her hair down, but that is not done. But, you know, Hatsumomo being Hatsumomo, she gets away with a lot of, you know, we do a lot of stuff for her. And also, normally, you don't really have things hanging out, and I have a lot of stuff hanging out in Hatsumomo. You know, she gets a lot of these things because she absolutely is, she's just so stunning. And when she walks in, it's just, it's incredible. The Gon Li is a character. She's kind of outrageous. Described as she would do anything to get what she wants. Did you touch this? I was very interested, and so did Rob, to make it kabuki-like, more like, to exaggerate it, so that everything is going this way. Gong Li inhabits a room like no one else, and she also inhabits a kimono like no one else. And she wore the kimono in a different way, with a huge amount of attitude and amazing style. She's a woman that broke rules, and so she was going to wear color. She was going to wear a strong color and kind of more strong patterns. Each character in the movie wears the kimono in a different way. Mameha came in, and you could tell right away that she was a very precise person. Mameha, who is the elegant, gracious geisha, she has more of subdued colors, the beiges and the grays and the, and the mauves and things that uh, you would see on an Upper East Side lady in New York. Sayuri is softer, uh, more fluid, the Audrey Hepburn of our, of our world. And uh, her world came from the look of the blue eyes. So it came from the blues and the cools and the pastel world. Sayori's costumes are very reflective and feeling. That's the mood of her costuming. There's a lot of sort of moody blue grays and sort of softer reflective colors in her costumes. Sayori is so sweet and innocent. So she gets all the beautiful young Maiko kind of hairdos. You know, this is one of them. This is one of her little hairdos I did for her. Here we would do their little bow. When she becomes a geisha, we go way out and create some fabulous looking stuff for her. The Sayuri's character travels in a different times. Nobody told me what and the In the 20s, say. 30s, 40s. So that was very interesting to mature her more than age her. All right, hold it. Colleen had this incredible facility that was literally the size of a football field where these costumes were being screened and painted and sewn and uh, designed and arranged and built and I've never seen anything like it. This is a kimono we're making for a scene with Sayori toward the end of the movie, but we're on, you know, 
Matt's painting it, and, and um, we have a couple more steps to go on it, but it's been dyed, stenciled, painted. It will have a little embroidery done to it, and then it will be finished. The amount of time it takes to make a kimono in Japan runs about one year. So for this film, we've had to kind of fast track it a little bit and had to make a lot of kimonos. Probably it takes about a week to two weeks if we're rushing and people are on overtime to finish one kimono. They are using classical textiles and printing on the, um, the silk. So they're reproducing some kimonos from the early age, which is like 1930s, 1940s, but they're reproducing that beautiful kimono in 2004, which is amazing. By just watching those many kimonos, it makes me feel like I want to own everything. You know, I wanted to, I wanted to have this. You know, I was talking to Colin if I can perhaps get some of those kimono for myself, if I can buy them. It's not possible, but I wish I can. We should make our own lines of kimono or something. I can see that any woman who sees this movie would say, that's something I might want to wear because it is, it's all about the look. It's all about what it achieves. It's all about how it seduces. Of all the disciplines that the geisha learn, dance is really the penultimate to them. If you can really score as a dancer, your future is pretty much secured. Japanese traditional dancing is, it's subtle and it, it can be slow. And Rob and, and John and Denise, to me, they put like a, a razzle dazzle to the... documentary because you can go watch a documentary anywhere and see what exactly what they do you can go to Japan now and it's because they're still doing the same traditional things but we did want it to have in a way a kind of a sexiness and a kind of contemporary edge they have butterflies here when you want like catch it Miyako Tachibana is our most important colleague because she knows all the rules but she felt free in 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 allowing us to break them Coming into this team, they have Chicago behind them. And John is a Bob Fosse dancer. And Denise is a Chicago Dream Team dancer. And it was really intimidating. To me, everybody's on warp speed. I mean, their mind is tick, 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 tick. Yeah, 
Yeah. yeah. And we have to get it. We have to get it fast. It has to get done. It has to be perfect. And, and there's just no, you know, taking it easy. Here, keep it fluttering, keep it fluttering, keep it fluttering. She was there to nudge me up, John, you would never do that. No, nope, never, never. I said, well, what if I, mm, okay, you know? <laughs> We would say, you know what, if it would only do ba da 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 and we'd say, now make that look Japanese. What would that be in, you know, Japanese dance style? My character had to perform a solo on stage. So for that, I had to learn a special dance. Um, it was named the winter dance. We sat down and thought, we need to find something for her to dance that can mirror what's happening to her in the story so that she can be emotional on that stage. And so that's why people are so entranced by her performance, because she is actually experiencing something on the stage that she's actually experiencing in real life. And so I thought, okay, well, I'll make it a, a spurn courtesan. And she goes out into the snow and is going to her death. Yeah. It's like those precious hands are kind of trying to make sense of it all. There were lots of elements that led to this, this particular story. Part of it was the shoes that she wore, which are these eight-inch spectacular platform shoes with only like a thong-like attachment, so there's like no support. When I first arrived at the rehearsal room, I saw a pair of platform shoes that were about 12 inches tall. I thought it was just a prop. But then I was told that I had to dance in them. There you go. They were like a foot, maybe over foot high. They were tall. And John had a pair for everybody. He had a pair for himself and for Denise and for myself. Many rehearsals later, and after falling off the shoes many times, I got used to them. She's fearless. She just hops right in them and walks. And I mean, I bet you she could tap dance in them if she wanted to. It was your own thing. It was beautiful. Here we go. Pictures out. Camera team ready? And roll sound. A mark. B mark. D mark. Playback. I watched the rehearsals for it and knew that the kimono had to serve the dance, which is the first rule with, with doing dance costumes, because it's a huge amount of work to dance in anything. So once I saw the dance, I knew what my restrictions were and what things I had to do to accommodate Z in wearing the kimono. decided to do it on a hanamichi, which means flower way in Japanese, which is a ramp that runs through the audience. We thought that would be quite beautiful because she'd be so close to the audience and so close to the chairman who was seeing this. We took two pieces of different music and, you know, we put them together and added certain instruments. When I watched it, it was long and I wanted to condense all the good stuff a little tighter, <laughs> just from my own. I said, we. We just don't have enough air time you know, in the movie. And even then, you know, as lovely as the dancing is, if it's not pulsing the story forward, cut, you know? I mean, it's almost like a prayer. That's one thing that Rob and John are really great at. The one thing that I really learned from both of them in, in a rehearsal situation, we'd come up with ideas, and there's a lot of brainstorming and, and, and a lot of freedom and creativity, and then it only gets better and better and better, and then it ends up where it's supposed to be. the discipline, you know, of always working and perfecting. When you're in this league of performance, you know, you do it over and over and over. How can we make it better? Watching John DeLuca, he is, he is a genius. He learned the vocabulary of Japanese dance, and he absorbed it himself. Then he made something new with it.
It was like somebody learning a new language and then, you know, making making a statement with it. We are separated by a language, but in the end, it's not about the words. It's our artistic representation of this time when the geishas really ruled. Very nicely, beautiful, beautiful. are somewhat mysterious even to Japanese because most Japanese don't have uh, enough money to be entertained by geisha. They're very expensive. To most Americans or to most people in the world who don't know how involved it is to become a geisha, they assume a geisha is a prostitute. Well, this is the stereotype, certainly in the West, that geisha are playthings of men. And what I found was that it was a, a community of women who are really dedicated to preserving the traditional arts, not only as teachers, but as performers. The world of geisha is run by women, and it's made up of women, and there really aren't any men. The women are the ones who run the business. The women are the ones who earn the money. They will get involved with men, the right man, in a longer-term relationship. Adana is your patron. He will support your continuation of your art form. You know, when you go for practice, your music lessons, your dance lessons, your kimonos, which would probably be more expensive than an apartment. Many men of that time were in arranged marriages. So men who were looking for love, I guess, that they could choose on their own, found the geisha as their love. My children wait for these every spring. Everybody knows that uh, the chairman has a wife. Maybe the wife is crying, like my, my grandmother. Um, this is my personal story. But uh, my grandmother, of course, had a husband, and husband fell in love with the geisha. So I can't quite take it so casually because it's more personal for me. It was a big secret for my family. My grandfather had a mistress. She was a geisha. <laughs> She's sophisticated, uh, very smart. It goes back to the 17th century and the profession of geisha, which literally means artist, artiste, and the first geisha were men. They were entertainers who came and told jokes and played music for the, the courtesans or the prostitutes and their customers. After about 100 years, women started doing that. Women would come in with shamisens. And these women were called female geisha. So that was really the start of this profession. All right, shamisen. It's not that small, so it's, it's not like, you know, cellos and violins. Liza Dalby came to us directly from Arthur Golden. When I said, okay, here we go. We're going to make your beautiful novel a movie. And he said, I think the first two words he said to me were Liza Dalby. <laughs> Liza was the perfect person because she was a geisha, you know. She was the only foreign woman ever to become a geisha. It's an extraordinary story. She went there to do her dissertation and to do some research about what the geisha life was like. I did my field work for anthropology on the subject of geisha in modern Japanese society. And it was only after about six months in Kyoto when I think the geisha realized that I was serious. They began to kind of develop a stake in my understanding their world. And at one point, the woman who became my geisha mother said, you know, you won't really understand it unless you feel what it's like yourself, unless you accompany us. Being able to play the shamisen was what really gave me credibility 
in their eyes, and that also gave me the ability to sit on my legs Japanese fashion for many hours. This is a very important skill for a geisha. My geisha mother, um, who was behind this idea, went around the community and borrowed some kimono from geisha who were especially tall in order to fit me. Everybody was very excited about it. It was kind of a fun thing, but then when the day actually dawned, I think everyone started to get a little bit nervous because um, you know this had never been done before. You have an older sister who's your mentor, you know, very much like Sayuri and Mameha. So I just stuck with my older sister and followed her, and you know she would give me a little cues of where to go and, and what to do. I found that in an odd way, being brought up as an American meant that it was easy for me to converse with men who were old enough to be my father because, you know, we are not socialized to be shy and retiring in front of, you know, very um, prominent older men. You could almost hear the older geisha sort of heaving this big sigh of relief that, oh, this is going to be okay. It's a very treasured part of my life, the time that I spent with them. I go back to the tea house where I did my training every time I visit Japan. She came back and wrote this fascinating book about her experiences and what it's like there, and opened that world to a lot of people who would never have known anything about it otherwise. So that way it really... She was able to help us inhabit and enter into this world. Grab it down here and then kind of hold it. So she was, in an odd way, our greatest translator and became our teacher to our actors. You pick it up and so it comes to the front. Right. And taught them how to move and bow and sit and play the shamisen. All the rules that go along with being a geisha. It's a hidden and mysterious world with its own code of conduct. As I immersed myself in the world of Sayuri, I discovered how harsh a geisha's world is. It's not an easy life but it's a life of the privileged few, because if you get chosen to train as a geisha, you know that possibly for the rest of your life you will be well taken care of, where you are regarded with a certain kind of honor, that you are a performing artist. You're not just somebody on the roadside. So geisha's life is to become a geisha, you can't have the luxury of pursuing true love. Life as a geisha, you don't get to live like that of normal, ordinary people. And you do not pursue love. You do not pursue what you would assume is your own happiness. And you have to live by the very rigid traditions. This movie, even though set in Japan, tells a universal story about women and about the limitations that society puts on them. Chris, you please. Look at this. Sneaking around like criminals. This is not something that only happens in Japan. I think women everywhere in the world experience that.